cool. Hi, welcome to another episode of Scorpio Season here today with your hosts, Lisa and Venkat. Venkat, hey, how's it going? Hey, Lisa. Um, doing good. We're talking about the letter Y today, um, and we've decided to focus on the topic Yeti. Um, which, so I wanted, like, okay, so Yeti, there's like two kinds of Yeti that come to mind when I say Yeti. One is the cooler, the based in Austin, Texas. There's like this cooler company that makes like ice chests and a uh, mug that you put your drinks in and it stays cold forever. Um, so it's like kind of a capitalist version of the Yeti. I don't actually know why they call themselves Yeti. And then there's the other Yeti, right? Which is a like mythical creature that's kind of like uh, Chewbacca from um, Star Wars, right? It's like a Yeti, big snow creature. Yeah, so that's the relationship. If it's making ice boxes, the Yeti is a creature from Snowy Mountains. Oh, Snowy Mountain guy. Okay, cool. So. <laughs> You can okay. buy That's a portable. funny that you didn't connect the dots. No, because I like, I guess to me, I always thought of Yeti as like Bigfoot, but Yeti is specifically like the cold mountain region. Yeah, Yeti is a Tibetan uh, myth. So it's like Himalayan uh, mountain. So uh, if you, so Chewbacca, I, I, I think from Star Wars movies that I've seen, he comes from like a tropically looking planet, or maybe I'm confusing him with Ewoks. And Bigfoot is... Uh, sort of the American wooded sort of uh, hills or something. So yeah, Yeti is the high altitude version. High altitude mm. version. Like, okay, but so when do you think, that, do you know how old the Yeti myth is? I think it's pretty old. I mean, it's a traditional Tibetan myth and uh, Westerners, I think, heard about it when they started trying to climb Mount Everest. So from local Tibetans and stuff. Uh, so Yeti is a Tibetan word. I, I think so, yeah. It's one of the mountain language kind of words. I think so, so we wouldn't have had, basically we wouldn't have had like the icebox Yeti if there wasn't the like whole movement for Americans to go climb Mount Everest is what I'm hearing. Probably because they wouldn't have heard of it. Like back, I think um, in the 1910s, 1920s, there was this huge movement of like just general exploration. That's when like the Shangri-La myth was... Uh, uh, popular. So Shangri-La was this mystical city or mythical city in uh, uh, Ladakh, which is the mountain Tibet region. Uh, so it's kind of like the El Dorado of um, Central America. So there's always these mythical cities. Um, that's kind of when I think this happened. And I'm also thinking of, uh, uh, there's an, do you know what the Tintin comics are? Uh, is that the one that's got like a dog and a boy? Yes. Hold on a second. There's one comic book that I have that has Yetis in it. So I'll bring that. Give me a second. Then cuts off to go find the comic book that's got Yetis in it. So we'll be back right after Venka comes back with the Yeti comic book. Okay. I don't have it. Uh, looks like I either don't have it or I lent it out to somebody and uh, forgot about it. Uh, but yeah, so the Tintin comics, I think, were popular. He started writing them just before World War II and uh, they were popular through like the 60s and 70s. And one of them is uh, uh, Tintin in Tibet. Uh, I might actually be able to look up the year here. Uh, 1958. But uh, yeah, it's based on, uh, I think events in the 1930s or something or 1920s, 1930s. So back then, I think there's a lot of this sort of exploration going on and uh, uh, Western explorers in particular discovering like myths in other parts of uh, the world. So that's kind of interesting. Like if you think about that period, it was like uh, like space exploration, but on earth, like cultures discovering each other a lot, mainly Western cultures discovering non-Western cultures. Mm -hmm. But it was kind of like that. Uh, yeah, oh, and uh, I've been to Nepal uh, twice in my life. And I think one time the hotel we were staying at, the uh, attendant guy was telling us all about the Yeti. So that's how I first heard about it. I must have been like 10 or 12. Mm, okay. I mean, I it's a local, it. yeah, there it's kind of like Bigfoot is over here. So they all kind of have like stories, like uh, there's people who will actually claim to have seen a Yeti when they were out in the snow or something. Wait, and so what do they look like? Do they look like Chewbacca? Was that a correct? Like I mean, obviously nobody has seen one, otherwise it would not be a mythological creature, but yeah, 
the depictions kind of look like a large um, ape-like uh, humanoid creature. Okay, so kind of this is like sort of in theme, but talking about adventuring out on mountain passes and the cold snow. Have you heard about the thing out in Russia where like a couple of hikers disappeared? Like I want to say in the eighties or seventies, um, like maybe like eight people went on a hike in on like the Dostoy Pass or something. The Dostoy Pass. No, I didn't hear about this. What happened? I'm going to get it wrong. So basically, it was like a, it was one tent full of, of hikers. They were out on holiday, kind of like master's students at a local university, took the train to go on like a long hiking weekend, but skiing, hiking and skiing across the landscape. Um, they disappeared. They had to send out a search party for them. And when the search party ended up showing up, the scene that they happened across was just wild. The tent had been, was empty, and everyone's like all of the all of the people's like shoes and clothes and stuff were still inside the tent. The tent had been ripped open. Um, they later discovered, so seamstress came by and discovered, like found out that it had been ripped open from the inside. So they were escaping to get out of it. And then the hikers had all died in various ways, kind of scattered across the slope. Some of them were found with like clothes missing, like half dressed or frozen in the snow. Um, others of them had really horrible, like damage done to their head and like, they were like even farther oh. away on a stream bed. Um, and it was kind of this like open case, like the case itself kind of falls into this interesting period where Soviets were like, not sure how much to trust like the official government line of anything. So like there were all these deaths and people were, like, well, what happened to them? Were they in like a secret weapon? Um, what year was this? I'm gonna guess it was in the seventies, maybe the eighties okay. or sixties. That's a large range of 30 years, but yeah. and. and uh, since Russia has what bears are the large predators and wolves, so it could be a bear or a wolf. Could right? have been a bear of a wolf. Um, I've seen theories that were it was like kind of actually like an interesting, really fast, heavy um, wind that kind of like wind tunnel hurricane that like hit the tent and caused everyone to get scared and run away. Um, though the New Yorker had an article, so the reason it's top of mind for me is the New Yorker had an article on it. I want to say with a few weeks ago. Basically, someone back in 2019, like an actual Russian researcher, decided to reopen all the case files and attempt to actually figure out what happened to them. His conclusion that he reached is that an avalanche fell on the tent. Um, so like a big block of ice hit the tent, which stunned everyone, woke them up. And rather than stay there, they ran out as fast as they could because they were worried that more avalanche was coming. And they ran in all different directions. They ran in all. Well, it sounds like so. The theory is they like so they they opened up the tent. They ran out. They ran to the nearest group of trees they could find, which was not within like avalanche territory, so to speak. So if there was an avalanche going to happen, they would be kind of in safe anti-avalanche like ground. So once they get to the trees, it looked like they split up. Some of them tried to light a fire. Other than of them tried to go back to the tent, probably to get more. Um, stuff but it was apparently like in the middle of a blizzard they probably got lost and froze and then um as the article goes on to say a few of them were found kind of buried on or next to a um a stream and they think that what they were doing is like the ones who had stayed by the fire started trying to dig themselves like a shelter in the snow to like stay protected they got really unlucky and started digging on top of a buried um, river, like a tributary river. So they accidentally, so like the river wasn't frozen, but it had like a layer of ice above it. And as they started digging to try and make themselves like a hole, they actually disturbed it and fell however many feet down to the riverbed and then got smothered with 20 feet of snow on top of them. Um, so yeah, so everyone died in some horrible way. Um, and then, you know, when you show up- I shouldn't be laughing, but I don't know. <laughs> These things make me amused somehow. Because you're a Scorpio and like grim things are like a source of much amusement. Um, so clearly I remember every detail of what happened to them. Um, yeah, so anyways, I thought it was interesting though that like the researcher kind of came up with like, hey, here's what happened. Here's our like best guess at what happened to them. And there's still people, I think like the official people who had like commissioned the report or whatever, like, no, this doesn't seem like it's right. And like still are like, no, that doesn't. So there's still some like refusal to accept this is the thing. It's a lot like taking an, an icicle though. So like the whole thing is like the, the search party didn't arrive for like two weeks, right? So whatever the snow conditions were on the night that they perished were completely changed two weeks later. And it's a lot like the old, I want to say Encyclopedia Brown thing where they use either like an ice block to like weigh down a um, 
to like kill someone in a car or like an icicle to stab someone with. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And like you know, then the the coroner shows up and like, oh my god, they died from a horrible thing. We can't find the murder weapon. Um, and it's because it melted. This seems like the <laughs> natural causes version of that. Like they like, got hit by an avalanche and the avalanche disappears. When you show up, like their tent is there and everything seems fine. You're like, what the hell happened? Like did a yeti attack them? Um, maybe that's kind of interesting. So things that happen because of things that then kind of vanish, leaving no trace, and then people kind of make up stories. Um, yeah, but before we move on to uh, more things beyond yetis and mysterious uh, Russian things, I did find like pages from the comic book. So let me just share that to show our viewers what that is. Okay, so this is one depiction of a yeti from um, the Tintin comics. And you can see it kind of looks like Chewbacca, right? Can you see yeah. my screen? Yeah, it looks like Chewbacca. I can yeah, and uh, this also oddly enough has like an avalanche crashed plane scenario. So that's how they find it. So. Tintin is in China meeting with his friend and he's flying back or something. And then the plane crashes in the Himalayas. And as they're trying to survive, they end up and running into the Yeti. And as it turns out, this particular imagining of the Yeti is he's a really nice, kind creature and he actually saves Tintin. Like he saves him from the cold. He doesn't die. Oh, but, um, yeah, so it's a friendly Yeti. Kind of... Yeti who saves you, not a Yeti yeah. who dumps snow on your tent. And I think the punchline is something like, oh, another name for the Yeti is, you can see on the screen, Abominable Snowman. Oh. And uh, mm. I think the story goes on to say, okay, that's not abom abominable at all. He's a really nice guy. <laughs> anyway, so that's Yetis. Uh, yeah, so these sorts of things, uh, I kind of wonder to what extent yeah, this connects to our uh, the other topic we wanted to talk about yearning, which is to the extent we find something mysterious and we can't explain it, we tend to make up sort of not, it's the opposite of Occam's razor, which is that you should look at the simplest explanation that fits the facts, right? And instead of thinking, oh, maybe an ice block fell in and ripped a hole in the tent, people's minds naturally go to maybe a mysterious monster killed them, right? Yeah, um, like a um, missile test or like yeah or they were like i think they found a lot of um radiation on them and like oh like it was some sort of like i don't know got taken out by special forces something um and, and we can see something like uh, the example you were talk uh, talking about before we got online the uh ufo stuff yeah that stuff like um i, I can think of like a couple of simple explanations one is uh it's a psyop, another is, it's like some sort of spoofing technology by like uh, one of America's um, enemies, like, you know, something that'll fake a radar into thinking that it's a fast moving object when really the, it's not a fast moving object, but just a spoofed signature. But another interesting theory I heard was, um, this is actually genuine technology from like China or Russia or somebody else has invented this, but the US military rather than admit and let on that they're tracking it and trying to figure it out. They are like spreading this UFO rumor, partly to like um, just confuse the issue and not let uh, the adversaries figure out what they're actually thinking. So that sounds to me like an interesting theory. But the interesting thing is the eagerness with which we lap up any theory that introduces a completely unnecessary new unknown, right? Like when there's 10 plausible theories of which eight don't have any appeal to monsters or aliens or anything. And two that do, we will gravitate towards the two interesting ones that have aliens in them. Yeah, that's like, hmm. Cause like, okay, I was thinking like, you know, this like this hiker story that I just told the, I feel like the answer, like Occam's razor says the simplest explanation, but even that explanation I just gave seems fairly complicated, right? Like there are multiple moving parts and like things that happened, right? Um, so like aliens aren't necessarily, like why, like, so I guess my question is like, so why are like aliens often like not Rock Occam's Razor? Like what about the alien construct of explanation makes it so like not, cause it seems simple to just say, oh, it's aliens, but is that because- oh, It may be simple in that you have, you have an explanation with just one moving part instead of say three. Yeah. But on the other hand, that one moving part is a completely new entity you just made up and have no basis to introduce, right? <laughs> so it's like- Actually observed outside of this like- Yeah, like if I make up an explanation in terms of radar spoofing and things like that, there have been examples in history of the radars are real. Signal spoofing is real. Enemies have been known to do that kind of thing. So if I say something like, 
enemies are figuring out a way to spoof radar signals. That's at least, it has like three moving parts, but mm -hmm. at least there's somewhere to go and investigate this falsifiability. Whereas aliens, you're just like, it's like appeal to God, like, you know, God created the universe kind of thing. Yeah. It sounds simple, but it's not because you're introducing a new element. And I think this, uh, this I think links to yearning. We kind of like want new things in our universe. So when we kind of feel, I don't know, some sort of existential angst that the universe is not interesting enough for us, we make it interesting by adding ghosts and monsters and gods and aliens and things like that. Yeah, those are more interesting than like, oh, they accidentally dug into the wrong part of the snowbank and fell <laughs> to like the icy thing, right? There's a fun, have you ever read any P.G. Wodehouse, the British humorist? Mm, I don't think I have. Okay, he has a very fun short story, again, from the 1910s or 20s or something that um, uh, sort of gets at this, which is two guys go into like a um, club or something. And as they did back in the day, they put their hats and, you know, sticks on the whatever, the hat check thing when you walk into a room. Mm. And when they went out, they accidentally uh, wore each other's hats. But one of them had this fantastical imagination and he went around telling the story, something like it was the fourth dimension. Somehow the hats got uh, changed around and shrunk in the fourth dimension. So he made up that explanation. And you know, the whole, I kind of gave over the punchline, but the punchline is that the hats just got traded. And this was because back then uh, Einstein's theories were new and everybody was very excited about the fourth dimension and was trying to explain everything or like, you know, they were trying to like shove the fourth dimension into everything. So it was like, all right, we just accidentally traded our hats. That became an excuse to shove in the fourth dimension. So it's, uh, yeah, I think that's a real human tendency. It's, it's, I mean, it's like, well, I think it's like, we're kind of getting around to like explanation, right? So like explanations of things like that tell us why things work the way they do. Um, and this is like, I mean, at this point you start veering into philosophy of science, right? Um, which is kind of like what David Deutsch's book, The Fabric of Reality, like has like a very like, it's kind of got four parts to it. And one of the big kind of four tenets that he talks about is how explanations come about, because that's like what science is based off of. And science moves forward when we come up with better explanations, and then we change our models to like, use the explanations or like create new theories around you from these explanations. So like you kind of have a new way of explaining the world. And then because you have a new way of explaining it, that gives you new ways and new experiments to try to like prove or disprove whether or not that explanation is actually true. Um, but I think he's kind of like, at least David Deutsch, the reason that he's explaining why this works is he's trying to be like, science isn't like, you don't just like come up with a hypothesis out of nowhere. You know, science, like the whole scientific process is create hypothesis, design experiment, run experiment, analyze, come up with a conclusion, right? Like, does that prove or disprove the hypothesis? But David Deutsch kind of tries to set that like hypothesis creation mechanism into like, no, well, usually you don't have an hypothesis unless you have like this broad narrative, like a construction and explanation. Oh, totally. Uh, the, uh, what you're calling the scientific method, I like to think of it more as the science bureaucracy method, as in you may have come up with your theory in any which way possible, but when you write the paper, you have to write it in that structure. Yeah. So other people can look at it and say, all right, does this argument hang together or not? So the yes. actual process is a lot more uh, intuitive and- uh, Right, exactly. It, it, and, and there are cases where science sometimes goes Occam's razor, where it's like, all right, what's the minimalist explanation in terms of like concepts we already have? But other times, even that minimalist explanation is too like clumsy and doesn't work. So you have to introduce like the equivalent of like, you know, gods and monsters. So if you look at, for example, uh, the discovery of antiparticles. So Paul Dirac, the physicist who came up with that theory, he looked at the equations, the symmetry had two solutions and he was like, there have to be antiparticles. And nobody at that point had observed antiparticles, but it was easier to explain, it was easier to hypothesize that the symmetric equation has two solutions, which are a particle and an antiparticle, mm -hmm. than to say that no, only the particles we know about exist and some other mysterious factor prevents the symmetry of the equation from having its natural consequences. So in that case, it turned out that sort of, uh, you can think of it as the broader Occam's razor um, sort of suggested that you should actually introduce new hypothetical entities to sort of fill in the blanks. Hmm, right. I see. Uh, 
kind of like yetis. So are antiparticles yetis? Kind of, yeah. I mean, in that case, they're unnecessary yetis because there are actually simpler explanations within things you know. But in some cases, yeah, antiparticles yetis. Uh, another one would be uh, helium was first discovered in outer space, like the element hadn't been discovered on Earth. It was discovered through these spectrums of stars. There were like these um, unknown absorption lines and there were like no known element makes that particular absorption line in the spectrum. So it must be a new element. And that's how they discovered helium. And then they looked and they found it on earth as well. So that happens quite often in science, but most often in science, it's not completely sort of um, imaginative constructs. Like a Yeti is an imaginative construct in the sense of, um, maybe somebody saw the footprints of a larger than usual bear in the snow. And then somehow imagination ran wild and they made up this whole theory of, oh, there's this bipedal human-like large creature that's not a bear, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so that's sort of a fanciful approach, whereas something like this equation has a symmetry and therefore there must be an exact mirror image of this particle that also exists. That's I think a much more conservative process where you're not infusing things out of pure imagination. You're like following the implications of something like, you know, symmetry, right? So I think it's not the same. So I, okay, I take back what I said. A Yeti is not an antiparticle because it's not like uh, made up in an exact way from a symmetry from something else. Mm -hmm. You're adding information. You're adding fanciful imaginative information to the picture. Right, right? I see. Have you invented any Yetis, do you think, Venkat, in your lifetime? Yeah, these can't be invented, right? They have to be hypothesized. And then you have to make sure nobody can disprove that they exist. I see. You don't have to prove that they exist, but you have to make sure nobody can disprove that they exist, right? So what Yetis have you created? Disprovable, undisprovable um, stories? Hmm. I don't think I have. I'm very scientific. I don't make shit up. Have you? Have you made up something? I don't think so. I mean, I feel like when I took physics class, people used to ask me how things worked, like in school, like, you know, the teacher would explain a thing and I like, I'm not the best at paying attention in class. Like, I'm just, that's just not my role. That's not how I roll. Um, <laughs> but I do tend to kind of figure stuff out on my own. Like, that's just how I figure things out. Anyways, people would ask me how stuff works in physics and I would like kind of look at it and then like make up something up. Um, like to explain why it did the thing that it did. And I feel like enough times I was like, it was like 80% right on. There was like 20% were like totally off base. I was like, well, that was a theory. Um, I can't think of any great examples, but I definitely do remember at some point, like saying things and being like, I don't actually know if this is true, but you seem to be buying it, so. Yeah, and I think that's actually a fair way to come up with reasonable hypotheses. It's, it's not actually that terrible. Um, like sometimes you come up with, um, like you've heard of phlogiston and uh, luminiferous ether, right? No, I have not. Oh, you have not? Oh, these are uh, like your kind of theories. So what does that fact, mean, Venkat? Hmm? What does that made mean, Made up, Venkat? like totally made up and the 20% that are like totally off. So before they figured out okay, how... Uh, right, okay. 80% like, hmm? of them were fine. <laughs> That's what you claim, we don't know. But uh, yeah, uh, Phlogiston was this, uh, I think, 17th or 18th century theory of how fire works. Like there was this idea that this there's this element that is kind of like that creates fire. Before they figured out everything about like you know burning oxygen and radiation and all that stuff, they had this hypothesis of a, a substance called phlogiston. Uh, ether was what they thought uh, uh, light traveled in, and so they thought vacuum was full of luminiferous ether because. The reason they made that up was people had shown that uh, light was a wave and if it's a wave, it must be waving in something. So it needs a medium. And therefore there has to be a medium and they just gave it a name, luminiferous ether. And now okay. we don't think that we are anymore. We think in terms of wave particle duality and we don't think waves necessarily have to have a medium to wave. We think in terms of fields, which I don't know that, that they're much of an improvement over oh, ether. Yeah, it's not, it's not. Hmm. Uh, but it is, I mean, uh, I'm kidding. Uh, but back then they like literally thought of it as a mechanical medium, like, you know, water or a solid object in which waves can form. And they did things like calculating what would be the stiffness of that and what would be the density of that. Mm -hmm. And they came up with completely nonsensical um, results, mm -hmm. right? Because if you make weird assumptions, you're going to come up with weird answers. 
What, uh, what else is like that? Uh, no, no, oh, I think I have a, I have a recent Yeti. I have a recent okay. physics Yeti if we're talking about Yetis. Um, I think my recent physics Yeti is that what my like totally uninformed idea about dark matter is that it's actually the like weight of all the possibilities of universal possibilities. So okay. like unrealized, like it's kind of like where the um, the shadow like branches exist. They're not matter. They don't exist, but that's like the weight of them like measurable as a dark matter that's not a bad idea yeah right exactly. i like it yeah maybe 20 percent. at least you're totally like full of bullshit yeah there's like it's not totally out of left field as in there are people make up such theories like there's this uh, i forget where i saw it but there's this theory that uh, because information cannot be created and destroyed, but it looks like in a black hole, information gets destroyed somehow when matter falls into a black hole and goes degenerate. So one hypothesis they've made up is on the surface of a black hole, there's these like structures, hair-like structures, which have information, but no mass or energy. And uh, you're kind of like making a similar kind of hypothesis. Um, so maybe the way to think of these things might you're make, doing it via analogy by saying that these um, dark probabilities have like weight or mass in the real universe sense, but maybe it points a way to a way to think about mass in a multiverse sense. Exactly. And maybe mass exists in a multiverse, right? Right. Yeah. It's yeah. It's personally based on like the multiversic like thinking. And I, I think I've read at least a couple of science fiction stories that um, use premises like that. So yeah. It's a fun idea, yeah. But then you have to do the math and show that it actually works. Math? No, we don't do that. That's not. <laughs> I am the whatever. Like, isn't there like the hypothesis version of the math, and then the like actual execution of the math, the experimental versus the theoretical? So I feel like yeah, actual... I think that's just the Lisa version of the physics and <laughs> the everybody else version. I think of like the physical version, like in physics, the expert, the theorists, like still are the ones who actually are doing all the math, right? Like they don't. Sure. Really... I mean that's. That's the actual work. I mean, otherwise, uh, there's no difference between like science fiction and science. You can just make anything up. That's true. All right. What else do we have for why we didn't get to yearning? But yeah, the connection I was making was that um, the reason we make up the unknown is that we yearn for there to be there to be more meaning in the universe than we perceive. So the explanation is one reason we sort of uh, make shit up about things we see. And another reason is to create meaning. So it's like, you know, that's the reason the Scorpio constellation exists. It's not fun to look at the sky and say that the stars form a random pattern. So it's more fun to say, hey, that looks like a scorpion and let me make up a myth about how, you know, scorpions are involved in predicting the future. Yeah, yeah. You seem skeptical. No, I was just thinking about like, I got kind of distracted by a thought that I'm having trouble remembering that had to do with like, well, kind of like how you went back and you were saying like ether was like a really kind of fun, exciting like idea that there was like this like light ether, right? And then, you know, we kind of, as you're saying earlier, sort of changed it to like now there's like field of whatever the particles are moving through, which like maybe that's better than ether or not, but it's definitely not as like romantic, right? Like you kind of lose this romantic ideal. So it's like the reality didn't change. Like what we still see and observe like as, as the same as it's always been, right? At least especially where light is concerned, just our way of like thinking about it. And even like our, like there's something about like when you decide that like the process has been explained, even if you don't totally understand it because of us, like how many of us actually do understand like the wave field equations exactly but like there's some amount of like dismissiveness that we apply to that explanation that when it was like ether and cool like weird stuff like you kind of give more um magic to so like it's like nothing has changed except how we explain it and that's made all the difference yeah and you're like look at what explanation means like uh, when we think of explanation in scientific terms all we really mean is it makes predictions that work out and it's like it's a very utilitarian uh, view of explanation. It's like the wave particle theory of uh, electromagnetic radiation is more correct because it makes more correct predictions in a compact way, right? Yep. And it, yep. that's, that correlates to how satisfying it is as a way to view the world, but it's being a satisfying view of the universe is not the primary property on which 
scientific theories are judged. The primary property is, do they make falsifiable predictions? Does it work out? Does it explain more and more with very few moving parts? But if it happens to be satisfying and elegant and beautiful as well, that's almost like a, a nice to have feature, but it's not the you know money feature. Yeah, and, so I'm wondering right? if there is a way to explain it, like say the same things, like not change the like content or context or like way of doing it, but doing it in a more romantic way, whereas the like the actors and narrative is a bit more like, I don't know, um, fanciful in some way. That sounds weird. But like, so you just change exactly what you're calling the things. Instead of magnetic field, you call it like, I don't know, um, I don't know, force field, the force. We call it the force and like, yeah, I don't think that works. You can't just change the names and um, we could change. No, I'm saying it won't work because you it's because you now know more. You're pointing to a less mystical subject, right? It's not that uh, when you went from luminiferous ether to uh, wave theory, nothing changed. Lots changed because now you had a more powerful theory that I, I shouldn't use the word explanation. You had a more powerful theory that allowed you to make more predictions, do more things, build radios. You could do a lot more with it, which means that the thing you were looking at was less mysterious. And if it's less mysterious, renaming it doesn't help. Like you can call it like angel I mean, force or something. We can call something. it doing magic though. Being able to build radios sounds It's no like longer magical. That's magic. the point. The magic is gone. Now that you've kind of gained control over it, it's no longer magical. So you can call it magic, but it doesn't feel like magic. I feel right, exactly. But I feel like we at least we could call it magic and maybe make it feel more magical. I don't know, but I think I think we're getting at something kind of interesting here about a human's uh, relationship to understanding and our environment, right? And like, there's something about understanding our environment that does remove the magic, and maybe we should work on ourselves to make that less the case. We'd still okay. be like amazing. Yeah, this would be, yeah. this is, I've been reading a lot about this concept called remystification, which a lot of, uh, is it remystification? No, re-enchantment, sorry, not re So it is, <laughs> re enchantment is this sort of vaguely reactionary political idea that's like make the world feel charmed again. And mostly it leads to people getting medieval and reactionary in their attitudes, but there's something there that's actually kind of interesting. If you don't take it to like a boring place, like let's all pretend to be medieval again, but you think of re-enchantment in terms of, can you look with beginner eyes again at the universe, even despite knowing a lot more? That's kind of a fun way of thinking about it. At, uh, oh, it's 3.10 already, so We're like yeah. Way over. yeah. <laughs> Okay, so that's why Yetis and Yearning and things like that. And next week will be Z, the final episode of final season Final episode two. of season two. We're almost there, Venkat. This is very exciting. All right, so what do you have for Z? Uh, zygote. Hmm? Zygote? What do you have for Z? <laughs> I actually don't have anything, so I'll have to think about it. Okay. Hmm. Plant some right. seeds, maybe plant some seeds for next week. We'll find out what you've got for Z. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, Venkat, as always, it's been a pleasure. Uh, we'll chat next week. All right. Bye. Scorpio season is proud to be sponsored by uh, Smoke and Screws, the premium filter for your glass pipes, water pipes, and one hitters. Check out their next generation screen technology at smokeandscrews.com. Great. Um, and if you liked our show, don't forget to like and subscribe.